Thank you all for coming tonight in person and on Zoom. It's great to have so many of you here joining us, uh, both, both virtually and, um, and in person. And as we gather today, we're all on Indigenous lands. For those of you joining us from home, I encourage you to learn more about the Indigenous presence in your area, both past and present. For those of us at the Museum of the White Mountains, we are on Indakina, which is the ancestral and present homelands of the Abnaki, Kennecook, and Wabnaki peoples. We are grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waterways. For those of you on Zoom, we put some links in the chat where you can learn more about the indigenous histories in your place at native-land.ca, as well as the Abnaki peoples of Northern New England through the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective and the Musée des, des Abnaki in Quebec. And I tried this afternoon to write a formal introduction of our speaker tonight. And I, there were no amount of degrees and achievements that could really capture um, Marsha's role in this museum, in my, um, what still feels like a very brief time. Um, so I, <laughs> My notes just say intro Marsha, which is only slightly helpful, but I think uh, captures how um, impossible it is to put into words the role that Marsha Schmidt-Blaine has played in this museum over the years and really in the 18 months that I've been here. I'm so, so grateful for your mentorship, your encouragement, your willingness to respond to my endless and sometimes you know, urgent <laughs> yet trivial emails. Um, I am, I'm so so grateful and just delighted to to have you here with us tonight and to be able to celebrate your research and the the kind of intellectual core that that you've brought all these years to to the museum. So um, we're all very very glad to to have you here tonight. Um, and our event tonight is made possible uh, in part by an organization that Marsha is also very involved in. So our speaker series this summer is supported by New Hampshire Humanities um, in partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities. And um, Jade has put the link to their website. You can learn more about NH Humanities if you haven't already. And um, as, as many of you already know, Marsha is now the chair of New Hampshire Humanities Board and is um, a really, I can't think of a better advocate for the humanities in our state. So we're so grateful to bring your service to the museum and to our broader humanities and intellectual community in the state. I want to thank those of you who have shared some of your ideas, people in the chat in particular. I saw some really interesting um, answers from people who went up in fourth grade to people who grew up here and said, well, you know, you know, it's nature, that's what happens. Uh, to people who, like me, I actually went in the morning, I had this picture that somebody had sent, like it's the last picture taken of the old man before the clouds closed in. I had him on the door of my office for, I don't know, 10 years maybe until I moved into a different office. But some people who've been in New Hampshire their whole life haven't seen the old man. Um, Quentin's mother is a great example. She grew up in Hampstead. And when she was 80 or so, Quentin took her up to the old man because he found out she had never seen it. And it was pouring rain, but as they got down to where the old man viewing area was, the clouds cleared. My mother-in-law got to see and meet the old man. And then the clouds closed in again and they, the way they went, it was just like, it was a miracle type thing. And I know a lot of you have that deep, closeness that comes with thinking about the old man. He's New Hampshire, somebody said to me not too long ago. But why? Why is he a symbol of the state? Why is he something that we think of when we think of New Hampshire? Why isn't it Lake Winnipesaukee or Mount Washington? Why the old man? And so that's what I started trying to figure out. What is it about the old man that pulls us in? That makes us, oh, you've heard me call him him, right? I bet you did the same thing. You know, he fell. He's the one we would look for as you came through the notch. He, well, of course, right now, he is a pile of rocks. And that's about it. And then the taps at the bottom. So the Museum of the White Mountains exhibit on the old man is the perfect time to think about 
why do we have these feelings for the old man? Why do we still think of the old man and think of him as the perfect symbol for New Hampshire? Well, if we're thinking about the making of an icon, what is an icon? And when we're thinking about an icon, I thought, okay, let's just go and look up what is an icon. A person or thing regarded as representative symbol or as worthy of veneration, an important and enduring symbol, a person or thing regarded as a symbol of a belief, a nation, a community, or cultural movement, or I might add, for a state as well. I think we can all agree that this fits how we think of the White Mountains and the old man. So if he fits these definitions, how did he come to be that icon, that thing we think of? The old man has been a draw for as long as white travelers have written about him. Now, Native American oral tradition does include stories about the old man, but you may be wondering about you know, the Abenaki and their relationship to the old man. As Megan noted, this talk takes place on the traditional ancestral homelands of the Abenaki people past and present. And we acknowledge and honor with gratitude the, la of the land and the waterways and the people who have stewarded the land. That said, this talk is gonna focus on 19th century cultural white Americans. So with apologies for both the Abenaki and the Mohawk traditions, their stories are not going to play into the development of the old man as an icon for today. And so I'm gonna give them short shrift and for that, I apologize. But as they noted earlier, indigenous New Hampshire has some of the stories, some of the oral traditions that have been captured. And so it's a great place to go to get more. Also Lisa Brooks uh, website, Our Beloved Kin is another really good one. So I started trying to figure out what makes the old man an icon. I came up with seven elements that all together come to think of the old man as an icon. So romanticism and its offshoot transcendentalism, guidebooks that came about as the old man became more popular, urban issues, commerce, artists and printmakers, a timely fascination with geology. If you're like me, I love geology. And popular writing. So these seven things that I've just laid out, it almost sounds like they happen one and then the other and then the other and then the, no. It of course is these things happen, another thing happened, and then the same thing happened again. It, built on each other and in many ways is like a crazy quilt that all came together to create the status of the old man as an icon. We're gonna start with looking at some of the context and start with romanticism. This is a late 19th century stereo view, but it'll give us a sense of what the workers who were laying out, surveying a road through Franconia Notch saw when they looked up and I put this in quotes, discovered the old man of the mountain there up on Cannon Cliff. The people who first saw him thought that the old man looked like President Washington. Some people later said President Jefferson. In other words, the old man right from the beginning began to get some of that ref reflected glory from American founders. Now, in the early 19th century, going through the notch was really difficult. It was slow, could be dangerous. The road was less than adequate. It was difficult. So let's look at how that began to change. Also remember, we're, we're building the old man into an icon. At this point, he is a really cool face up on a rock. The first part of this does start with romanticism. Here are pages from three important, in this case, transcendentalist works. I know, the one on the right's awesome, isn't it? You're going to see nature. That's exactly what Emerson was saying there. So when we're looking at the transcendentalist, this is a time that Americans were working, moving away gradually from the rationalism that had defined the life and the intellectual life of the early founders and towards a, a reliance on emotions and the senses. So romanticism really glorified a person's most, their deepest emotions, the natural world and imagination. 
It was an international movement and it stressed an individual's emotions, their reactions, and especially their reaction to nature. American transcendentalists were a close offshoot to romanticism. They glorified nature and they wanted readers to truly see nature. They urged their readers to explore, to see, and to be uplifted by wilderness. I bet many of us hike for that same reason. This is a blurb that was in the Museum of the White Mountains exhibit catalog as time passes over the land. And I'm just going to read you a tiny bit of this quote. And it is, of course, the essay, Nature is Much, Much Longer. It's well worth your time to read. So a short quote from Emerson's essay on nature. Nature never wears a mean appearance. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There is nothing I feel I so try again. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life which nature cannot repair. In concert with Romanticism and the early transcendentalist, the White Mountains came to be a destination, a place to see the sublime, to be in nature, to be awed by it, and to study the workings of the natural world. Americans were searching at this point in time in the early 19th century for what we are, who we are as a people. They were looking for deeper meaning and a national worth that really goes beyond the rational mind, doesn't it? So they were seeking what made this nation, this brand new nation, culturally and visually unique. Before we get carried away as I often do on the romantic beauty of the mountains. Remember that writers like Ralph Waldo Emerson or Henry David Thoreau or Margaret Fuller, who was as famous as the other two that we know now at that point in time, along with Nathaniel Hawthorne, Washington Irving, Francis Parkman, and so many more, they helped to popularize the area. And in popularizing this area, they made this landscape a sellable commodity. So we've got an interesting combination there of commerce and romanticism and writings all coming together. Great Stone Face is still not an icon. In the 1830s and the 1840s, the first large groups started coming to the White Mountains and they made rather slow progress on co by coach or foot and it gave them time to gaze about and to write detailed explanations of their experiences. How many times do you go through the notch in 30 minutes? Yeah, it would take them a few days so they would see what was there in ways that we just don't anymore. People visited, news about the alluring beauty of the White Mountains got out, all sorts of advertisements, letters, broadsides, art, but how did they know where to go, where to stay? Well, let's look at some guidebooks. This guidebook is really the one that everybody focuses on. It's an amazing guidebook, The Fashionable Tour. This one is the 1828 edition. And this is the first one that included not only the old man, but the White Mountains in general. In this book, they laid out plans that wealthy travelers could follow. Yes, wealthy travelers could follow. In 1828, the fashionable tour our author noted that the road through Franconia Notch was much improved in 1826 and is now tolerable. A few years since, yeah, the mail was carried through the notch on a man's back, but now a stage passes from Concord, New Hampshire in one day, twice a week, and has continued on to Montreal. The stages that began running in 1826 made regular runs from Plymouth through Franconia Notch to Littleton and beyond. And at first they were carrying commercial traffic. That was what was expected. But then they began to turn to the tourist trade. As the guidebook noted, at the place in the road through the notch where the path goes up the mountain, is exhibited to the view of the traveler on the mountain opposite to Lafayette, the profile or the old man of the mountain, a remarkable curiosity. It is situated on the brow of the peak or precipice which rises almost perpendicularly from the surface of a small lake. All the principal features of the human face as seen in a profile are formed with surprising exactness. 
Good accommodations are found at the Franconia Hotel, kept by Mr. Gibb, and all necessary facilities for visiting the curiosities in the neighborhood are provided. Another, so interestingly enough, 1828 um, guidebook that mentions the White Mountains and the old man was the, the Northern Traveler. The inveterate traveler, Theodore Dwight, published this guidebook. In it, he mentioned the old man. From, the st uh, from Plymouth, a stage wagon goes through Franconia Notch to Littleton. The road follows the Pemigewasset through fine, magnificent scenery. The country, however, is almost uninhabited until reaching Franconia, where are iron works and a curious profile on the mountains called the Old Man of the Mountain. There is an excellent inn at Littleton, the new brick one. His treatment was offhand. Apparently, the old man did not impress him. But these guidebooks at least told people where to go, where they could see, and what was there. But why would people leave the comfort of their homes in the cities and come to what was a really difficult place to travel in? For some people, they felt compelled to leave the city and had the means to do so. 19th century cities were not healthy places to be. Coal was the main source of fuel, leading to dirty air and health issues. Food was increasingly adulterated as desire for profit really outpaced the ethical behavior among food producers, not all, but some. Open sewers ran through U.S. cities, all U.S. cities, and infiltrated and contaminated water sources. In the first half of the century, too, the nation's population exploded by 336%. Now, it sounds willy, but it, that, that's a huge increase. Much of the population growth went to the cities, and New England is where urbanization advanced the fastest, and it's where epidemics took hold and had a firm grasp. In the 19th century, what turned out to be waterborne diseases increasingly reached epidemic levels. Most scientists at the time believed that bad or smelly air could carry disease, the miasma theory of disease, a much much smaller number believed instead that it was unclean water that caused disease. But it was the late 19th century before there were water and sewer systems in any of America's cities. So disease ran rampant, uh, especially amongst the poor and especially in the summer. So those who could afford to leave the cities often left the cities seeking a place that would be safe for their families. So thus primed, well-to-do travelers began to seek out not only the progressive spots like the Saratoga uh, Springs or the Franconia Ironworks, which were a huge draw, believe it or not, but also areas that had clean air, clean water, and a place they could get a healthful rest. Now, Inez McDermott mentioned the sketch of the old man that was done by 15-year-old Francis Appleton in 1833. And I want to look at Appleton's journey just a little bit closer. Appleton's mother died of tuberculosis, one of those rampant diseases of the 19th century. All the disease needed was a nearby body to move to and crowded cities provided nearby bodies. As a matter of fact, uh, Francis's uh, brother Charles died two years after their mother did from the same disease. Driven by grief and perhaps fear for his children, Appleton's father, who was a U.S. Congr congressman, left Congress, gathered his children, and proceeded to follow the fashionable tour in a two-month away, getting away from the city, from grief, and traveling, and away from urban areas. 15-year-old Francis, who was better known as Fanny, um, and her siblings and her father traveled in a private hired coach that you can see on the screen. They stayed in small hotels and taverns, the best money could buy at the time. But I want you to look closely. Look at the road they're traveling on. If you know about corduroy roads, that's where they just put down trees and covered them with a little dirt. And that was a road. Uh, can you imagine? It was not comfortable. And you can also see there are things on the road. That was it. By the way, this one is labeled coolness from all quarters. They've got their window shades rolled up. 
Now, Nathan Appleton was Fanny's father, and he was a well-educated and prominent businessman. You know about the Waltham Lowell system? He's one of the people who designed that. He was also an amateur geologist. That may be the reason that the Appletons went to Franconia Notch instead of Crawford Notch. Franconia Notch provided what the author Randall Bennett called a museum of natural curiosities. Here's the sketch of the old man done by Francis Appleton. During their escape, Fanny added the old man to her sketchbook. Perhaps the solitude of the place and the solitary nature of sketching appealed to her. Certainly the beauty of the mountains did. She wrote, one is almost bewildered by the ever-changing variety and has hardly admired sufficiently one sweet landscape before a turn in the road brings an equally picturesque and rural scene, yet differing from the other entirely. She loved it. By the way, her family continued to come to the mountains even after her death. She, she was um, someone who was very instrumental in making the mountains important to their family. Her drawing was one of the first, if not the first, on-site rendition of the old man. Appleton's family sought solace and healing from nature and found it here. If you'd like to know more about Appleton, by the way, you should see Diana Krasenik's insightful article about Appleton that was published in Historical New Hampshire in 2009. Well, thus far, we've seen that the mountains were a draw to early 19th century elites because of the mountain's beauty, their emotive sites, and their perceived health-giving effects and safety. Let's add another element. Let's look at commerce and commercial activity. This is another Frances Apple. I love her sketches. Uh, and the National Park Service does such a good job of making them available to people. So this is another one of her sketches, but what it shows is the wide open vista, doesn't it? That is not something that just happened. There were farmers, traders, and loggers well established in the Pemigewasset Valley in the, by the early 19th century. Farmers changed the landscape by clearing woodlots and pastures. A lot of them had sheep and opened a lot of pastures for them. And they farmed on the lower hillsides to feed the growing downstream textile industry. More and more acres were opened by lumbermen. New roads like this one also inadvertently open new vistas. Tourists were drawn to the scenery that farming, logging, and travel exposed. This is a commercial activity, obviously. After all, they needed to be able to um, get to the mountains and farmers and lumbermen needed to make money that way. Artists and printmakers also, if you think about it, were not only a creative activity, but a commercial one as well. Artists wanted to have something that people would want to purchase. So with views revealed and the romantic disaster of the Willie slide associated with the mountains, professional artists began to visit. Thomas Cole was amongst the first. One morning during his uh, second visit to New Hampshire in 1828, a solitary Thomas Cole left his uh, hotel up in Franconia and began walking through the notch, expecting to catch the stage that we've talked about. He wrote, through the pass called Franconia Notch, there is a good road on which a small coach passes on its way to Plymouth. Sallied forth, expecting the coach, as it was its day of running, to overtake me in the notch. He then described the picturesque vision of the old man of the mountain, as the country people called it, a singular crag that has the features of a man strongly marked in colossal dimensions. Suppose that this head is 1,500 feet above the lake. The stillness of this lake and the silence that reigned in this solitude was impressive and sublime. Yeah, well, he may be saying that about the old man, but did he draw the old man? Except for that tiny sketch that Inez McDermott found really cool to see, uh, the old man didn't catch him, not enough to turn it into something like this. Instead, Cole's time walking and sketching through the notch following the Pemigewasset River gave rise to his beautiful painting, Morning Mist Rising, the Pemigewasset River, New Hampshire. He returned home to his, uh, returned to his home in New York City, filled with admiration 
for the mountains. At least three, possibly four artists were up in the mountains that year, the same 1828 year. Henry Cheever Pratt, who was a friend of Cole, and they had traveled quite a bit together. Possibly J.S. Blunt and Thomas Dowdy. I love this painting. It is upstairs in the current exhibit. Thomas Dowdy was a first generation White Mountain painter, but less well known and certainly less well appreciated than Cole even during his lifetime. Yet he was one of the artists that Thomas Cole studied and admired. Dowdy first visited New Hampshire in the 1820s, probably in reaction to the 1826 Willie Slide. He lived and worked in the White Mountains between 1828 and 1838. Excuse me. He lived and worked in Boston between 1828 and 1838, traveling to the White Seat summer, each summer. Cole and Dowdy were at the forefront of a new type of painting, romantic landscape painting. They opened up the path for other painters with similar instincts to follow. Thanks to Cole, for instance, his friend and mentor, Asher Duran, became a leading artist of the Franconia region. Some of their paintings were then turned into prints, making them available to more and more people and helping to popularize the region. The work of artists and printmakers also mentally decreased the distance between urban centers in the Northeast and the White Mountains. And so tourists came. Where did they stay? That's another aspect of commercial activity that is needed, that was needed to embed the, New Ham uh, the old man into New Hampshire's psyche. In 1835, Stephen and Joseph Gibbs the Gibbs were the ones who owned that hotel in Franconia that I mentioned a minute ago. They opened a house, though, in 1835 in Franconia Notch called the Lafayette House. It was specifically to host a new type of traveler, the leisure traveler, the pleasure traveler, one interested in natural sites. The Gibbs already owned the house up in the hotel up in the town of Franconia, and then saw this as another opportunity, a way to make a different living. And the hotel was immediately popular. During its first summer, the English traveler Harriet Martineau stopped by the hotel and noted that, quote, the hotel has been growing in the woods for 13 weeks before, and yet we were far from being amongst its first guest. The Lafayette House was the first fashionable hotel in Franconia Notch to provide service to the pleasure traveler, as well as to those traveling for commercial reasons. The Lafayette's location made it an instant hit. hit. It was in between the Echo and um, Profile Lakes, very close to the old man of the mountain, and within easy walking distance of the flume. While comfortable for the time, it was not a grand hotel. When it first opened, the Lafayette house had it was kind of like an expanded house where guests could sleep. But remember, there was no reservation system at the time. You could write and ask, hey, I'm coming up at this time. I hope your letter got there. Maybe you would get there the day you said you would get there. It was usually hit or miss. So you would arrive at a hotel and ask if they had a room, which they may or may not. And you could end up sleeping on a cot in the hall if you were at that point lucky. I want to show you something that I find fascinating. This is an 18, probably 41 daguerreotype of the Lafayette House that was done by Samuel Bemis. You might remember that Professor McDermott introduced us to Bemis at the beginning of the summer. Remember that daguerreotypes are reverse images. So take the one on the left and flip it around. And that print, that the watercolor that we can see, well, is it a watercolor? Um, that we can see to the right, you can see it was a very good impression of what the Lafayette house was like. The Gibbs were savvy entrepreneurs. They'd hit upon a profitable enterprise. They and those who followed them commercialized the mountains. They monetized the views. They increased the value of inns and particular natural sites. With better accommodations, more travelers arrived. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that everybody's going, I cannot wait to see the old man of the mountain, because it's not how it was. 
As a matter of fact, Harriet Martineau again, that English traveler that I quoted above, I'll quote her again. My attention was directed to the profile, an object which explains itself in being named. The sharp, sharp rock certainly resembles a human face, but what then? There is neither wonder nor beauty in it. Perhaps it was because she was British. <laughs> and I say that having very close British friends. You have to realize though, the person who was pointing out the old man to her, that person was impressed by the old man. And people were increasingly taken by the old man. And he began to appear in a variety of media. So this is an engraving from Family Magazine, uh, it's called a Family Magazine, and it was published in 1837. And here is the whole thing. I just want to read that one little piece of the article to you. But perhaps the most singular thing of this character is the old man of the mountain, figured at the head of this article. This is found in Franconia Notch, which is, which is a continuation of the range of the White Mountains. It presents an exact colossal representation of the human face as seen in profile, surmounted by a helmet. I never thought of them as having a helmet. Uh, this face is delineated by the hand of nature or the brow uh, on the brow of a bare rock nearly 1,000 feet high. No art could improve upon the effect, nor could any attempt be made to assist it. This is from an 1856 book. Look at that picture. Yeah, I know. It's the old man though. Um, this book is courtesy of uh, Doug and Sue McLean. And I, I want to point out though that inside this book, the only time it mentioned the old man was when it republished an 1839 poem about the old man. It doesn't talk about visiting it or anything else. It's an interesting book. So let me read a little bit of the poem that H wrote in 1839. It was published originally in the Democratic Review. It begins, by the way, by noting the location of the old man and noting that it was already well marked for the tourist trade, where a tall post beside the road displays its lettered arms, pointing the traveler's eye through the small, mid, uh, small opening mid the green birch trees. Then the poet gives his reader time to either actually or figuratively turn his eye towards the profile. Look closer. Scan that bare, sharp clip on high. Aha! The one wondrous shape burst on thee now, a perfect human face, neck, chin, mouth, brow, and nose. All, all is perfect, no illusions there. It continues on for several stanzas. It is the 19th century. As the poet describes the old man and all that the old man has seen. Now we need to add another element to our mix to make the old man an icon. And in this case, we'll look at geology. And we'll do that by looking at a late 19th century view of the old man. Various new disciplines in natural history, geology being one of them, but botany and zoology being others, became, well, fashionable in the 1820s and 30s. And the narrow notches of the White Mountains provided a laboratory for Northeastern researchers and for the curious. Americans with an education, like Fanny Appleton's father, were primed to be interested in geology and Franconia Notch really excelled at this, these geologic curiosities. The world learned about the rock formations in the Notch, such as the old man, the plume, the basin, from a variety of articles and poems like we've just seen. But the old man became even better known in part due to the publication of geologic reports. Charles T. Jackson wrote the first annual report on the geology of the state of New Hampshire and the state published it in 1841. Jackson seems to have been kind of a traveling geologist, doctor, inventor, etc., and a man with a very prickly personality. Jackson always wanted to be, and generally claimed he was, at the first of whatever it might be. For instance, he claimed he invented uh, the telegraph before Samuel F.B. Morse, and he claimed that he had tried out ether and dentistry before it was actually tried out. Uh, so <clears throat> Jackson is an interesting character. 
This is, by the way, um, the daguerreotype of the old man that uh, Professor McDermott showed us. And you've got some additional information on what it took to produce this daguerreotype. You may remember she talked about it. it took an hour and 36 minute exposure to be able to get the old man. Well, Jackson was impressed by the old man and wanted to make sure that readers paid attention to it. In his 1841 report, he provided a how to see the area. He said, the most remarkable object seen from the notch is the profile called the old man of the mountain. This may be seen at a point indicated by a guideboard on the road. As the traveler reaches this point, he is directed by the guideboard to look on the opposite side of the way where he discovers a stern visage, a visage of gigantic proportions on the brow of a rocky mountain looking boldly upward. Notice his mention of a guideboard, just like that 1839 poem that I um, noted. And it's so similar to what we expect to see now. It lets travelers know where to stop, where to look, and what they should see. Jackson was back with another book in 1845 for a more general audience. It's called Views and Map, Illustrative of the Scenery and Geology of the State of New Hampshire. By the way, that sign that's on the tree right there is one pointing to the old man of the mountain and making sure people saw it. Jackson wrote, this is the wildest freak of nature's fancy which the world can show. And it is really wonderful that it is so little known and that it has never been accurately delineated. Imagine a perpendicular precipice rising from 1,500 to 2,000 feet in the midst of primeval forest, from the upper angle of which, sharply relieved against the sky, projects not a shapeless mass of rock, which by an immense stretch of the imagination can be tortured into something like a resemblance to a human face, but a perfect profile of an old man who seems to be gazing with expression of solemn awe into the valley below. He continued, no one can look for the first time upon the face of the old man of the mountain without a feeling of awe and astonishment. The first impression is that it is the work of human hands, but a little examination soon convinces that all access to it is impossible. The telescope reveals the structure and arrangement of the huge blocks of granite, which lying upon and overlapping each other produce such astounding a resemblance. He also highlighted other geologic oddities like the flume, which we often forget, of course, had that rock in it until 1883. And so word spread and travelers arrived. Let me tell you a little bit about Augustus Silliman, if you may be thinking. Silliman, but he's the guy who's the geology professor at Yale. No, that's his brother, Benjamin. The only thing I know about Augustus is that he was Benjamin Silliman, Silliman's brother, and that he corresponded at least once with John Quincy Adams, and he wrote a book called The Gallop Among American Scenery that was published in 1843. This book may have originally started as a series of articles published in journals, but that's all that I can find about it. His short description of the old man is very interesting. He provided the stone face with personality and thoughts. Here's what he wrote. And thou too art there, savage Mount Franconia, with thy fantastic and human outline. Old man of the mountain, with what grim stoicism thou lookest down upon busy miners, as with picks and powder blast they reave the sullen minerals from thy vitals. I watch thou by the lurid glare the sweating half-naked forgemen as they feed with thy forest the roaring furnaces. But fare thee well, thou imperturbable old man, fare thee well. For now we enter the dense continuous forest through which the busy hand of man has with unwearied industry cut the avenue. Augustus Silliman was essentially a tourist and part of a small but growing number of tourists. Now, this is William Brenton Boggs from Norwich Academy. Uh, they had an exhibit about him not too long ago. He tried to make his living as a painter of, among the White Mountains, and he was just a little early 
Um, and he, I said 1852, sometime before 1852, because he died in 1852. But after his graduation from Norwich in 1828, again, he had the freedom to explore the White Mountains and to mingle with his artistic colleagues. This is an example of a less dramatic landscape that the tourists saw. Another example is a tourist named M.W. Tappan. Tappan traveled by horseback with a group of friends in 1844. They wanted to hunt, fish, and see the sights, including the old man of the mountain. He was quite taken by New Hampshire scenery. He said, the whole distance from Bristol to here, especially the latter part of it, has been a continued succession of beautiful scenery. On either side of the way, mountains piled upon mountains, contrasting favorably with the broad and luxurious intervale of the dashing Pemajawasset. We pass through Plymouth and Campton villages today and in sight of Thornton. I'm going to include just a little bit because of where we are. Plymouth is one of the prettiest inland towns that I ever saw, pleasantly located on the river in the midst of some of the finest and broadest meadows in New Hampshire. These meadows are decorated with large elm trees, which, uh, which with the Pemajawasset flowing gracefully through them and the gorgeous array of mountains on either side, present to the eye a wild and picturesque landscape. This is the most beautiful part of New Hampshire. Uh, I can say that with some pride living here, which has rightly been called the Switzerland of America. Its scenery for wildness and beauty, not to say sublimity, I dare say can vie with that of any country in the world. I wish that the people were as good as the state, <laughs> but they do not appreciate their position. They do not adore it as they ought. A day later, Tappan and his friends tried to see the old man but were beaten by clouds. The next day, they went to see the flume, the basin, the pool, and then the fading light tried the old man again. This time they were successful. I'm going to read a quote from his journal and I want you to listen to his description of the old man and he really talks about him as an individual. And I'll give you another painting to look at from the current exhibit. So it's 10 years before this watercolor was done. Tappan wrote, further on and in the very notch itself, himself constituting no unimportant scene, part of the same, on a pinnacle of the mountain, high and lifted up some thousands of feet before the level of the pond at his feet, sits in silent and majestic grandeur, the old man of the mountain. We stopped and took dinner with the old gentleman on the shore of this beautiful sheet of water, which lies at the very base of his mountainous seat. We gave the old man a cheer, which means they toasted him. As we came through, when we could see his rough, though not ill-favored visage, and he seemed to receive the compliment with wonderful complacency. We also cordially invited him to come down from his lofty height and partake of our cheer. But he looked down upon us as much to say, though ages upon ages have rolled away and generations upon generations have passed from the earth. Since first I assumed my position here, I am yet neither hungry nor dry, or if either, I feed upon the snows that whirl about my time-worn temples and drink the water that burst from the mountain cloud. The profile, he continued, of the old man is a singular freak of nature. This is a... Um that you can see downstairs here in the museum. But we need to add one more cultural element to further cement the old man and the popular imagination and his status as an icon, and that's popular writings. I'm gonna focus on one particular writing and I bet all of you are going, yep, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and you are very right. Nathaniel Hawthorne's very popular short story, The Great Stone Face, first appeared in print in 1850. It has since been republished and anthologized many, many times. Few people know this piece now, and if you do not, I urge you to go and read it. It is a short story, and it's just not nearly as known. The story does highlight, though, the importance of the text and words to 19th century Americans and their desire to find a humble, worthy, and honorable leader. 
not something we've lost, I think. In the great stone face, Hawthorne described the old man thus. The great stone face then was a work of nature in her, um, in a mood of majestic playfulness formed on the perpendicular side of a mountain by some immense rites, precisely to resemble a human countenance. There was the broad arch of the forehead, a hundred feet in height, the nose with its long bridge, and the lips, which if they could have spoken, would have rolled their thunder accents from one end of the valley to the other. True it is that if the spectator approached too near, he lost the outline of the gigantic visage and could discern only a heap of ponderous and gigantic rocks piled in chaotic ruin one upon another. Retracing his steps, however, the wondrous features again can be seen, and the further he withdrew from them, the more like a human face with all its original divinity intact did they appear, until, as it grew dim in the distance, with the clouds and glorified vapor of the mountains clustering about it, the great stone face seemed positively to be alive. Now, this story was very popular and remained popular well into the 20th century. Um, it linked landscape and the development of character. And if you're interested in knowing more about this, the Museum of the White Mountains Summer Camps exhibit curator Paul Hutchinson had some really interesting things to say about the role Hawthorne's story played. Well, back to commerce again. Hawthorne's book combined popular writing with commercial activity. Yes, the commerce of producing his book, but also selling his book. It's how Hawthorne made his living. But it broadened the public's knowledge, and it also made Franconia Notch more publicly accessible. More people wanted to see the old man, more transportation was provided. So people went up to marvel at the profile and to write about the experience to their friends. But where to stay as more and more people came to the mountains? There was only one hotel, as we talked about, the Lafayette House, and it was usually overfilled with guests. Many had to sleep on cots, out in the barn. So seeing an opportunity, Richard Taft opened a new hotel, the Flume Hotel, just south of the Lafayette House in 1848. The Gibbs then expanded their Lafayette House, and there was a short-lived hotel race that went on. Taft won because he understood that the traveling public wanted more than just a room. They wanted social interaction with fellow travelers during their stay. His hotel included many parlors where like-minded individuals could gather to play games, converse, and even dance. Taft's Bloom House was so successful, he decided to build another hotel with more rooms and better amenities. Taft purchased the Gibbs Lafayette House in 1851, and the next year he tore it down. So in 1852, remember it had only been there since 1835. He tore down the Lafayette House to build the Profile House, deliberately associating his hotel with the popular profile of the old man of the mountain. He and his partner, Charles Greenleaf, advertised it as the most luxurious hotel in Franconia Notch. The hotel. hotel boasted 110 rooms, nightly bands, dancing, telegraph offices, daily mail, games, transportation, rentals, excellent food, and comfortable lodging. I'm ready to go there myself. The Profile House was the first all-inclusive White Mountain Hotel in any part of the White Mountains, and it was centered on the reputation of the now iconic Old Man of the Mountain. It was also an opportune business move. The Boston, Concord, and Montreal Railroad arrived in Littleton in 1853, only an hour away by coach or wagon from the profile house. And the railroad had already arrived in Plymouth in 1850, where guests could now catch a daily stage into the notch. Mountain vacations remained out of the reach of most until ra uh, railroad fares allowed the less well-to-do access to the mountains. These new, less well-to-do, and generally less well-educated tourists wanted to experience the mountains as elites did, but they didn't have the same education that included romantic poetry to meet the cultural expectations of the time and really their own cultural expectations. 
Luckily for them, guidebooks had changed over the years and now provided explicit instructions, not only on what to see and where to stay, but how to experience it, how you should feel, poetry you should read. And so I want to talk about the guidebook that probably many of you know about, and that's Thomas Starr King's The White Hills that was published in 1859. Thomas Starr King's guidebook is really one of the most treasured guidebooks of the many, many 19th century White Mountain guidebooks. It combined romanticism, especially romantic poetry, with guidebook recommendations. Starr King plainly stated, and I quote, the object of this volume is to help persons appreciate landscape more adequately and to associate it with the principal scenes, poetic passages. The poetic passages were chosen by him to make them pertinent to the particular scenes that he tried to connect them with. I'm going to read you a short passage from the White Hills so you can hear Thomas Starr King's mid-century interpretation of the old man. So after saying that Franconia Notch is a huge museum of curiosity, he continued and it's actually pointed out in the PowerPoint. The most attractive advertisement of the Franconia Notch to the traveling public is the rumor of the great stone face that high, hangs upon its highest cliffs. If its enclosing walls were less grand and its water gems less lovely, travelers would be still perhaps as strongly attracted to the spot that they may see a mountain which breaks into human expression, a piece of sculpture older than the Sphinx that was pushed out from the coarse strata of New England thousands of years before Adam. He then quotes Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poetry, explaining how appropriate it is for that spot. Miss Browning has connected a law of historical and social insight with a passage and a fancy that many of our readers would be glad to associate with their visit to the spot where the granite profile is revealed to them. Well, here's the quote I suspect you expected to hear long before this. And I found it, the earliest I found it is in Benjamin Willie's Incidents in White Mountains History containing facts relating to the discovery and settlement, etc. cetera, um, 1858. An eccentric speaker at the celebration a few years past since in Freiburg said, men point out signs representing their different trades out signs representing different trades. Jewelers hang out a monster watch, shoemakers a huge boot, and up in Franconia, God Almighty has hung out a sign that in New England, he makes men. Recognize the quote? I mean, all of us have heard it at some point or another. It's a really good one. And you may be thinking, yep, Daniel Webster said that. Maybe. Historian Maggie Steer has pointed out there's absolutely no evidence that said that Webster says that. And maybe he did, but we have nothing that says that he did, but it caught on. People associated Webster with it, and we've got two icons in, uh, in one quote. And it took on a life of its own because the fame of the old man, as well as the fame of this possible speaker, the old man was seen as a representative of rock ribbed New Englanders or rock ribbed New Hampshireites as well as an icon for New Hampshire. I love this painting. That's really the only reason I included it. <laughs> Plus it's just beautiful, isn't it? Prepared by the writings of the romantics and the early transcendentalist Americans with money and leisure traveled to the White Mountains to see the face on the side of Profile Mountain. Guidebooks provided knowledge to those who wanted to escape urban environments. Tourists were aided by commerce as roads were improved and hotels built. Artists and printmakers brought the old man into the houses of those who were visiting the White Mountains and put it on their travel agenda, or at least were able to gain an appreciation of that strange rock formation, the Great Stone Face. Writers spread the word of the old man far and wide. This lucky, and as we know all too well, impermanent collection of rocks became an icon for New Hampshire by the 1850s. And I will leave you there. And if you have any questions, I want to thank you. When did the idea of putting the old man's profile 
on everything. <laughs> Start. Seems to be in our lifetime. Oh, really? mm -hmm. Okay, the old man was important and he shows up a lot. Go ahead on this. Yeah, there was a commercial with him from Charles Fire Insurance Company, started using it in the late 19th century. Um, Reynolds State Energy Company in the early 20th century. Very proud of the fact that they were doing it, but in terms of New Hampshire, is a New Hampshire symbol? It was 19th that it became a state symbol. So, as I said, kind of. Seems like just yesterday. <laughs> Some of us. And it, you know, and I think you're right, Marsh. I think it's really been more in the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you repeat who it was that compared the White Mountains to Switzerland? There were a lot of Melanie, a lot of people. Uh, Randall Bennett's modern book is a good place to look for more information about that. And it was in, I mean, there's lots of material in the collection that is just kind of White Mountains in general about the Switzerland of America in pamphlets and brochures and, you know, other things for the, the tourist trade, the hotels were saying mm -hmm. it um, throughout the 19th and early 20th century, definitely in yep. materials in our collection, for sure. Good question. Mm -hmm. other, other questions here in person or, or on Zoom? I have a question that's, I don't think we can answer it, we've been struggling with this. Why, why do you think it's remained an icon? I mean, when, you know, we can understand in the 1800s with this romanticism, mm -hmm. but it's so many years later, we're still, what is it that, that makes people connect the old man with New Hampshire again? I think part of it has to do with New Hampshire and how New Hampshire perceives themselves as independent, as strong, um, as able to do anything that they want to do. I mean, it, it's a little tough comparing that to um, a rock face that fell. Um, but the other thing that I think about too is the old man I think we're as romantic as we as they were in the 19th century. I think that's a lot of it. I also think the environmental movement of the, particularly starting in the 60s, um, helped to make it something that people wanted to go and see and to hike to certain areas. I mean, it really brought people out into the mountains. So I think that's part of it. I wonder though, will my grandkids think of the old man and think of New Hampshire? Heck, will my children? Um, and I, Brooke, how do you feel about the old man? Oh, I remember when it fell. I remember being like the better it was in college. His mother called me. No, no. I remember having the newspaper um, thing for a long time as well. And he I was old. I must be very old. I was uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was just sad. <laughs> I don't know why I felt that way, but I did. It was me when my grandfather saw it. They still have one of the, my mother gave me a picture of the photograph of it. It's framed, and so I think it's fourth grade now, so that's in my classroom. And a lot of them ask, and there's so many questions about it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, and it's funny, I know that the uh, when the news of the old man falling um, reached out beyond New Hampshire really quickly. I and mean, it was in all the news. My mother called me and <laughs> said, I heard the old man fell. And my mother lived in Georgia. Um, but I said, yeah, you know, the whole state's in mourning. Because it really felt like that. You know, it felt like we had lost a friend. Uh, somebody who looked over us. Yep. And that was also relatively speaking, internationally. Yes. And I mean, people didn't know the Willies, but they were mourning. So this tragedy happened out of the blue. Mm -hmm. It had the same kind of impact. Oh, very macabre. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very 19th century. So um, Inez McDermott was just mentioning the interesting parallel between the old man of the mountain and how people perceived him 
and then the willy slide and it's disastrous really macabre end where nine people were killed and their house remained untouched which was bizarre the chapel also similar yes yeah. exactly exactly so the ambitious guest is what hawthorne wrote about so yes all of them are catching it um so um, we have well so we have a couple one is a a, a comment um from zach um found it fascinating how you treat 19th century american new england life in connection to the old man um it seems that he represents a mix of 19th century romantic ideas while also embracing mid to late 19th century shift to realism and transcendentalism very good i agree yeah with that. yeah um and then becky had a question um so the old man in the mountain is made of granite when was New Hampshire identified as the granite state? I don't know, Becky. What a good question. He was made of granite, but of course it's granite throughout the state. Um, I don't know. Anybody know? No. We are clueless here. Becky, do you know? <laughs> She's a historian. I'm yeah, I feel like she would she... No, says Becky in the chat. <laughs> I have to scroll down a ways to find it. <laughs> um and um, so the um, a comment about the um, New Hampshire General Federation of Women's Clubs place the profile stands for everyone to view where the old man had been. It was very sad when he fell on uh, May 3rd. Um, and we, we also, um, if folks didn't have a chance to see it, Kim Jarvis um, gave a great talk at the museum mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago and Kayla's put the recording up on our YouTube. Um, she talks about the role of the um, Federation of Women's Hubs in kind of saving of Franconia Notch and the and the role the old man played in that. And there's some material from them in the exhibition as well, and and the profile as the the kind of uh, emblem on their on their materials. Um, Kathy Husband, yes, Kathy, they did try to stabilize the old man man before it collapsed. The Nielsen family became well known for doing that. And if you look, you can see pictures of the old man right after he fell and you'll see turnbuckles and you know, straps that they were trying to hold him together and had been for, I don't know, 50 years? 16. 16, 1916. Gosh, almost 100 years. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And I, I have this clear memory of my third grade teacher rolling in the TV, which was a rare thing. Usually she would play things on the record player. She, we could square dance in our, <laughs> if there was free time, but she rolled in the TV, which was a treasure for us all. And we watched pizza be delivered to the Nielsen's oh, while, the old man. Yeah, <laughs> while they were, while they were repairing the old man. So that's just good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, about, you know, the, another comment about the way the old man was such a part of our routine of that, mm -hmm. that kind of twisting up in the back seat uh, to, to see it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right, uh, Melanie. People did, they were just so used to see, I still look for him when I go through the notch. I don't know how many of you do the same. I know he's not there, and yet I still look up every time. And that's a question. And I have that same feeling that I see described on here talk about the sadness that day, but also the shock. I mean, I knew at some point gravity would take over. And, you know, I just didn't think it would have to a pile of rocks. <laughs> and it leaves itself right to the question. Yeah. Why do we do a strong connection to an icon mm -hmm. that really is it's just raw. Because yeah. but I remember that day. I remember being shocked. And I lived in Lancaster for many years, so I would die. I could afford it. And it was all of a sudden. Yep. And all of a sudden, it was gone. Yeah, you know, and that's actually something I've started to wonder, too, is when was he first there? Was he there so that Abenaki could have seen him thousands of years ago? Is it something that appeared as different rocks fell off over time so that maybe he was brand new and I don't know. Uh, so it's just something to think about, you know, when did the old man appear? But he's certainly gone. Yeah. <laughs> and the future. Oh yeah, sorry folks on Zoom if you couldn't um, hear the in-person questions, but yes, we'll, we'll be more diligent about 
about repeating them. Sorry about that. Um, other other questions or comments? Yeah, Maria. Uh, this is a comment. I think one reason people loved him so much or were so attracted was that he looked like the most honorable, strongest, uh, upright gentleman around. Mm -hmm. Just he was like who you wanted to to be running the show, <laughs> and I. I you know, we just kind of lucked out that he was, he could have been like really weird looking. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the audience members just mentioned that one of the things that gets us about the old man is how honorable he looked at something, someone we liked, someone we wanted to be like. Well, and I, I was, so I spent the day in Franconia, not today um, for the Old Man of the Mountain Legacy Fund's Family Fun Day. And um, I was talking with someone about the watcher, mm -hmm. right? The other, like, the, it's not the only rock formation. And we, uh, you know, we had a comment earlier in the chat about Indian Head. So I think, you know, at one point, and there's a, there's a great postcard in our collection um, that has the three of them, right? It's a horizontal postcard and three vertical views of the Old Man of the Mountain, the watcher, and Indian Head. Um, and, and I think there's something to this about the kind of, uh, that rugged sort of, you know, jawline, you know, and it was a very distinct, mm -hmm. you could not see it for a lot, you know, you had to get the exact right angle, but then when you did, it was really it was pretty real. indisputable that it was a profile. And I think, you know, we've, we've, um, Inez and I have had conversations about the, the kind of 19th century tradition of silhouettes, right? Where you would have these kind of black paper cutouts of of people's faces and that, you know, the reference um, to Jefferson, right? That people would have known, or if you think about the, the face that we see on a coin, right? It's that same profile view and that that kind of distinctiveness of the view set it apart. It's not, mm -hmm. right? It's not the old, it's not even, you know, there's three in Franconia Notch, there's, if there's, you know, there's others throughout the White Mountains, but there was something about that one that, you know, was this kind of perfect storm of all the things you've described today, but we don't attach all those to the other, so, other rock faces, the other rock formations that look like faces. So mm -hmm. there was this, and I think it's, as you're saying, that kind of recognition in, in that face um, that, that set it apart. 